if you don't take risks, you don't get very far. Welcome to Spur of the Moment, the podcast of Colorado State University's Spur Campus in Denver, Colorado. Honestly, I think it starts with curiosity. I think that's probably the most important trait of a scientist. All right, I'm going to go for it. And I did. And it was very hard. On this podcast, we talk with experts in food, water, and health about how they are tackling big challenges we face in these three areas. I'm Jocelyn Hiddle, and I'm joined today by Dr. Ana Cristina Fuyadosa, Director of CSU's Plant and Soil Health Diagnostic Laboratory. Dr. Fuyadosa collaborates with other scientists and educators to address the needs of Colorado stakeholders in ag. She has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin in plant pathology and a bachelor's in ag production systems from the Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala. Welcome, Ana Cristina. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. So... Let's start with what it means to manage the Plant and Soil Health Diagnostic Lab. It's a bit of a mouthful. Can you tell us a little bit about what the lab is and what it does? Yes. So what those labs do is they provide diagnostic services, soil, water, and plant testing services as well for Colorado stakeholders and other uh, stakeholders from outside of Colorado. Our clients are... A very diverse. Um, and so we receive samples from homeowners, farmers, researchers, um, consultants, and government agencies, et cetera. And they're all looking for us to help them figure out if their plants and their soil are healthy and if there's something that they need to do to improve Um, that for a higher production and productivity of whatever plants they're growing. As I understand it, the laboratory takes samples that are sent in either from individuals. So I could send in a sample from my backyard, like a soil sample, or maybe something from one of my tomato plants in my garden and, and ask you, you know, what do you see in, in this soil sample or about this plant sample that might help me be a better gardener? Am I on track so far? Yes, yes, very much so. So we, on a daily basis, um, we receive samples, as I said, from from people uh, around the state. Um, and what they want to know is, okay, uh, right now I I put my little plantlet in my garden and it just isn't looking so well. It's maybe a little yellow, smaller than it was last year, or it has some um, browning on the leaves or it just doesn't look right. And so they'll send it to us and say, can you tell me what this is and how can I help this plant grow? And what can I do so that I can prevent this from happening again in the future? And the same with the soil, right? So I could send in a soil sample and you would tell me kind of it's it's got enough of this, it doesn't have enough of that, and here's our recommendation for, for how to do it better? That's correct. So one of the advantages um, that we have in providing the service is that we're surrounded by experts. And so both experts from actually the whole university, but we mostly rely on the scientists in the College of Ag to help us figure out uh, how best people can manage their soil and their plants. And so um, you're correct. If somebody sends a soil sample and they say, I am ready to plant and I want to make sure that my plant has everything it needs. So primarily plants will get their nutrients from the soil. And so they'll send a soil sample so we can test it for chemical and physical properties. And we can determine if it's adequate for whatever they want to grow. Great. I confess that I am not a green thumb So these kinds of services sound like something that if I were to really set the goal of getting better would help me a lot. If I ever were to to turn my attention to getting better, I know where to come. But it's not only individuals that send you samples, right? So can you talk a little bit about who some of the other um, organizations or entities are that are sending things to you for your analysis? We receive plant water and soil samples from... 
uh, different entities uh, around the country. So we're involved in several different projects that are research projects um, that might be looking just in general uh, at soil health, that might be looking for how management uh, strategies have changed the soil and maybe improved it. I have a new variety of grape and, you know, is, is it doing well with my current management practices? And so these can be, as you mentioned, large entities. So we're talking about government agencies, um, very large national projects. I wonder if you could give an example when you say if someone is implementing a management plan, what does that mean? Yeah. So for example, uh, a farmer might say, I have a problem with a particular pathogen, let's say as an example. And so it's a soil pathogen. Um, And this is actually something that is happening now. It's it's a research project that I lead. The pathogen is called Spongospora subterranea, and it causes a disease called powdery scab. We could have a field, for example, that we know um, has a high irrigation um, rate because that's just the practice that has been done in that particular area. And we decide that maybe we're going to moderate the irrigation. And so um, this is actually for this particular pathogen, water is very important. And so what we would do is we would look at the soil ahead of time Um, We would make sure that we are planting clean potato seed, and then we would implement that management practice throughout the season. And then at the end, we could collect soil samples to see what is the uh, level of the pathogen in the soil, um, how did any of the chemical properties change with the management practice, and then we can also collect the potatoes and look at whether uh, disease happened and if it was reduced comparing in, in, in comparison to the field that was irrigated normally. Great, thanks. That's an that's an excellent example. So just to be sure I'm understanding what you're saying, you have a pathogen that's causing disease in the plant. And what you are studying is, it's, is it in the soil? And is there a way for the amount that you water, for example, that particular field to change how much disease is caused by that particular pathogen in the soil, what, whether it's a virus or a fungus or a parasite or a bacteria? That's right. That is an example of of a way that we can uh, use these services um, to improve agricultural practices. Yeah. Can you tell us about what are some of the more unusual things that get sent to you for your your lab to analyze? I mean, we receive anything from (laughs) seven foot long uh, tree branches to an inch long piece of bark. Um, we receive boxes of potatoes uh, to test for bacteria. Um, we might receive seeds um, to test for uh, any microorganisms or insects that might inhibit their export. It sounds a little like your your job is a bit like a forensic science show, but the mysteries <laughs> are being sent to you in the mail. Is that is that a good analogy? <laughs> I think it is. I actually, when I think about soil testing and plant diagnostics, I do think we're detectives. <laughs> and we have to use a lot of our knowledge and resources to figure out what the problem is. And so it starts from it could be anything to narrowing it down based on information that researchers have generated throughout decades of work. And um, and once you get there, especially when you see something new, it is so exciting. And then the other thing is, you know, scientists, we like puzzles because <laughs> this is not as, this is not easy. Um, we do have to integrate in a lot of knowledge and it, it can become really, really fun. When these mysteries and puzzles come to you in the mail, let's say there's a part of a plant that comes to you in the mail, where do you start to start to solve that puzzle? Like, what is the first step? Yeah, that's a hard question (laughs) because actually every puzzle is (laughs) always a challenge. Um, It's different uh, depending on what the sample is. So I'll give you two examples. 
Um, so if it's a soil sample that's coming in and let's say somebody has a problem because um, their plants are rotting, let's say, and uh, they think that maybe it's overwatering, but then they didn't really overwater, or at least not, they, they don't consider that they did, then we need to look at those the properties of the soil to figure out if there was something there that might have caused water logging or that might uh, prevent water from draining properly. Or maybe it's a, a, a goes beyond the physical properties of the soil into um, an excess or a deficiency of something. And so the first thing that we do is think about the environment from which that sample was taken. And we ask the questions to the client, you know, how did you do the sampling? What was planted there? Was anything planted there? What's around it? How do you water? How do you fertilize? After that, we really go to the books. And so uh, some of them are already in our brains, um, but uh, some of it we do need to um, look through. And so one, when we gather the information, we say, okay, there is a water logging problem, for example. So what could cause this? And then, as I said, the knowledge generated by others helps us figure out what could be the causes of water logging. And then we have to figure out if that's in fact the case. So we do the testing. And let's say we find that, um, let's say that there had been some clay deposits there or that um, there had been some additive that didn't allow for proper soil uh, drainage. And so we then go back to the client and say, this is what we found and this is what we think is causing it based on the test results and here is how you can uh, improve your soil. In the second example, very similarly, if you have a plant disease issue, what we do is, let's say it's a spot on a leaf. Um, well, I would say spots on leaves. <laughs> then... Um, then we would we would look at our literature and say, okay, what can cause spots on, let's say it's a tomato, what can cause spots on tomato? Um, and is this possible that it would happen in this environment? And again, we use that environmental uh, data that we gathered to figure that out. And then we'll go in and in the case of plant disease, testing is looking through the microscope or growing the micro any microorganisms that could be causing the problem and figuring out whatever we do find, whether or not it can actually produce those symptoms. And then once we've confirmed that, then we go back to the client and say, um, we think that this is causing the problem. It is either common or not common in Colorado or wherever it's coming from. And this is how you can take care of that. So you start with some of the things that you know, you start to narrow it down. You ask a lot of probing questions of the people who, who know more um, and slowly get yourself to, to the answer. That's, that's great. That's science in action right there. Anna Christina, can you tell us a little bit about how your lab will be engaging down here at Spur and what the opportunity is that, that you all are taking advantage of? Yes, we are very excited to be part of the SPUR campus and the programming down there. We have an opportunity to have a larger space to grow as a program. We also are looking forward to being in a more central location in the state. Being close to I-70 and I-25, it's, it's a great place to access our lab. It's also a hub for learning about agriculture. And as I mentioned before, if you want to learn about who's involved in agriculture, the labs are a place to start. Um, and if, you, if you're like me, just stay. <laughs> and, um, I think we have an amazing opportunity for people to see what we do for us to share um, what others in our um, in our field are doing by providing a space for them to do so. Um, our lab is designed with open windows so that people can look inside. And 
uh, I'm very excited about that because that means that it's not going to be a secret. You know, when we're doing our detective activities, you can actually see what the detectives are doing and take a peek in there. Look at, you know, look at what, what we're, how we deal with samples. What are the types of machines that we work with? Um, you know, how do we communicate in the lab? Uh, how do we interpret what we're seeing? Are we happy? Are we frustrated? Are we um, excited about something new in there? And so I'm super excited about that. So one of the things that I envision is a group of K-12 kids that are there at the Spur campus that have come on a field trip and they've made their way through the educational exhibits on the first floor of the Terra building, which is where your laboratory will be. And they've understood a little bit about, you know, cooking food and, and taste testing new products that are coming out of the Food Innovation Lab. And they've made their way upstairs and they are in the hallway outside of your laboratory, which, as you mentioned, has all these windows where they can look in and see what you're doing. And then Anna Christina steps out. Dr. Foyadosa comes outside and says, um, you know, and, and welcomes them and says a little bit about what you're doing right right then and there and gives them a little glimpse into that moment in time of, of you and all of your detectives in that laboratory. But it does require something specific from you and from your team to be ready to to talk to people and engage with with the general public. That's right. And, you know, we have a lot of experience in customer service because we do it every single day, multiple times a day. One of the things that will come with our move is that we will have the lab, but we'll also build um, an education and engagement program around that. And so we will, yeah, we'll need to learn, um, but I think we have a lot of support to develop uh, a larger education uh, program. And when I say education, I'm referring to higher ed, but also to K through 12 students and their families. And so that is very exciting. I think uh, also uh, when we think about engagement, we have to think about who our audience is. And so we are excited to be, as I said, in a centralized location for uh, farmers across Colorado to be able to access our lab and also to be in an urban location where we can work with Denver and the citizens of Denver and citizens of other cities um, using Denver as a model, perhaps, to uh, start thinking about uh, plant health and soil health in an urban setting. Um, and then I also think that we have an opportunity being within an area that has a larger population of uh, Latinx citizens and to be able to um, uh, broaden our, uh, our reach to a more diverse uh, audience to be able to include them in the processes that we're going through by just having an open door and to welcome them to opportunities at CSU, but more than that, to opportunities in science, to opportunities in ag, and to opportunities in development of their own interests and careers. When I talk about soil and plant health, we are talking about where thing where food starts. And, and this is again one of the things that I'm excited about in integrating our our uh, efforts with those of other programs at Spur because we we truly are thinking about food. We're thinking about our environment um, and about how people interact with those parts of life that are so elemental. I love the way that you're talking about soil health and plant health and water um, quality as as the building blocks of of how we are how we are feeding ourselves and each other. I also really appreciate your comments about the ability to do outreach to more diverse audiences, to young audiences. You know, we start to see that that kids once they are in the sixth grade or or somewhere around sixth grade, they start to see themselves in certain career paths and start to not see themselves in others. 
And I, I love the idea that we have real scientists at work, your team there doing real science behind, behind those windows and coming out and talking to kids and kids being able to see themselves in your laboratory to envision a future that involves science if they want it to. Can you talk a little bit about your own experiences being a scientist and particularly as you, you know, building on what you were saying about increasing diversity within, within STEM fields? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can actually start with my origin. So I'm originally from Guatemala and um, I grew up in a city and I didn't really know very much about agriculture um, except for the stories and um, that I heard from my grandmother and her family because she had been uh, living basically in a homestead for a very long time and until she moved and, and did other things with her life. And so when I decided to go into agriculture, I saw a great opportunity to contribute to humanity and to be able to hopefully make a difference in some way through science and education. And so I studied um, uh, agricultural systems in, in Guatemala. And then I, I met some uh, people that were doing research down there. And I got really excited about plant pathology. And that's how I came to study in the United States. Um, I'm saying all of that. And, and at the same time, thinking that, you know, I accept that I had a lot of uh, great opportunities in my life to do this. And even my being in this position right now is, is just a great privilege um, because we don't have a lot of representation from perhaps Guatemala itself, but also um, Latin America and, and people of Latinx origin within the sciences and in agricultural sciences uh, in particular in the United States. And so there are many scientists across the world and there are many scientists in Latin America, but uh, living in Colorado, um, we see, for example, that the demographics of Colorado don't quite match the demographics of our fields. And so, so I think that one of the goals that formed in my mind as I was going through my career was to be able to make this more accessible for others because it is really important that we have the perspective of a lot of people as we're uh, trying to come up with solutions for problems that uh, are real, present, and even emerging within the within agriculture, within just the natural sciences and, and the environment altogether. You know, we we're working for others. We're working to solve problems, to to be able to come up with more efficient ways to do things, um, to improve what we're doing so that we can have a more sustainable plant a world in a more sustainable way of living. And we can't do that alone. We don't have that power. Um, we have to involve everybody. So I believe that if we talk to people and um, engage with them, understand, you know, what, what are your questions surrounding what we're doing and how can we help you understand so that you can contribute, then that's, that's the best thing we can do as scientists. So everything you just said is one of the reasons that I'm so thrilled that you are a part of what is happening at SPUR. Your passion for engaging others in scientific exploration, in ensuring that more diverse young people and, well, diverse people of all ages are getting engaged in, in science and bringing their unique perspectives and experiences into the conversation is so important and uh, a big part of what we hope that the SPUR campus can do by kind of putting together scientists at work and, and education and outreach in one place and, and putting together different scientists from different disciplines too. We share the same hope, I think, that that we can solve 
problems better, faster, more equitably when more people are at the table um, and when scientists and, and, and all minds are sort of co- are working on these things together. So thank you for all of your passion and, and inspirational comments. So you have hit on this a little bit already in what you were just describing um, about your career path. Is there anything that you would like to to talk more about um, about how you got where you are? Right, you know, part of Spur is is kind of demystifying how you get to be a soil scientist or a, a water specialist or a chef. Yeah, honestly, I think it started with curiosity. Um, I think when, I think that's probably the most important, (laughs) um, trait of a scientist is curiosity. Um, because you have to ask a lot of questions and I was always asking questions when I was a child, I asked a million questions. And fortunately I had, um, family that was supportive of my question asking. Um, and they, my mom in particular, she really provided, uh, spaces for me to be creative and to express myself and, and to learn whatever it is that, um, I wanted to learn about. I confess that my uh, education up to uh, college was somewhat of an exploration for me. I had a lot of fun in school and um, I I really love learning. And one of my favorite uh, classes was biology. And so when I started college, um, I didn't really have a path defined, but I knew that I wanted to work in biology. I wanted to be able to learn more about um, our environment and nature and and see where, you know, I could find a career in that. And so at that point in time, it was, I just want to learn. And, um, and then as I went through college, uh, the school that I went to in Guatemala really did a fantastic job of uh, linking the science that we were learning with the impact on society. And it was very important. Agriculture is at the heart of many communities in Guatemala. And I learned about how much agriculture impacted those communities. And how those communities and their work, you know, they as farmers, um, impacted everybody else. So I got very excited about being an ag. And uh, when I I mentioned before that um, there were some researchers down in Guatemala uh, when I was in college, and I started working with them on a research project, and they were working on finding resistance to diseases. Uh, in tomato and uh, breeding tomatoes with improved traits so that they wouldn't be affected by these diseases. And so um, I had the opportunity to go to a field one day and I was rating tomatoes for size and color and, you know, how well they were growing, et cetera. And then a man came by and he was so excited. I couldn't exactly hear what he was saying, but I could tell that he was so excited. And, and as I got closer to him, I, I could he- overhear him saying that he was so excited about this particular tomato and that he wanted to grow it in the field over across from where we were, et cetera. And the person that I was working with, who at the time was my undergraduate mentor, said, do you know why he's so excited? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, because you couldn't grow a single tomato here before. And you couldn't grow anything. So there was a bacterium in that field that was absolutely devastating. Um, in experiments, we have controls and uh our negative control was a susceptible uh, tomato. It was susceptible to disease caused by this bacterium. And it was a stick coming out of the ground. There was no plant. And that was what that field was entirely. And so when he told me that, I don't know, I feel like it was a defining moment in my life and in my um, goals, professional goals, to 
realize that I could truly contribute to a change um, through research, through agricultural development. And so that's how I moved on to uh, going to graduate school. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I got a degree in plant pathology. And then I moved to Colorado uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. And I worked throughout my PhD and my postdoc on potatoes and uh, several different diseases of potato. Um, and then I had the opportunity to start working in the clinic. And when that was presented to me, the plant diagnostic clinic, when that was presented to me, it was very intimidating because you're going from, you know, I know about potato virus Y and powder scab and whatever specific pathogen uh, or pathosystem I was studying, which means, you know, the microorganism and the plants and the environment. Um, uh, surrounding that particular problem to I kind of have to help people figure out what their problem is in whatever they're sending me. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go for it. And I did. And it was very hard. But I learned a lot. I got a lot of help from others in my department from the network that I had developed um, in grad school and in my postdoc and from the people that were sending the samples. So that was very exciting. And the customer service part of it was hard, but it was incredibly rewarding. And so when I was, uh, when we were um, presented with the opportunity to propose um, our program it to grow and move to the Spur campus, I it was immediately a yes, because if I was this excited working in the lab that I am now with the resources that we have, to be able to expand to merging with another lab, to have you know one-stop shop kind of kind of a facility um, for agricultural uh, testing and diagnostic services and to be able to engage with the public that's like you know the dream and so that's that's how I ended up here and really it was um I'm not going to say a lot of luck necessarily but a lot of open doors that I walked through and not easy sometimes. You take a lot of risks. But if you don't take risks, you don't get very far. Thank you so much, Anna Christina, for, for telling us more about your path and, and for highlighting that there are two things that have to happen for you to move forward, right? A door needs to be opened. The second thing that has to happen is that you have to step through it. And I think that that's such an important message um, for all of all of us to remember as we're thinking about how we want our our careers to unfold and our what, what we want our impact to be. Personally, as a professional goal with this project, I want to be able to open those doors for people, for people of all backgrounds, for people that have curiosity, for people that want to learn, maybe just to to just to know, and for people that want to make a career out of it. We just have a few minutes left, so um, I am going to wrap us up with a couple of questions. One is, if people are interested in finding out more information about your lab, where can they find more information online? If they go to the CSU website mm -hmm. and um, they look us up, Plant Diagnostic Clinic um, or Soil Water Plant Testing Lab, they will, be, they will find our, um, our website there. And on that website, they'll be able to sign up to get more information or, or get information about how to send you samples if they're interested in getting some of their plants or soil or water tested? That's right. So on the website, we have the information uh, related to how to submit a sample, how to collect a sample. Um, and we also have our contact information um, if you would like us to talk uh, about those, that same submitting a sample and collecting a sample um, to you personally. Um, we also accept in the plant diagnostic clinic uh, images. So we have um, our email. Yeah, it's such an important service and a great way to get the, the 
most up-to-date information that is coming out of CSU and other research institutions into the hands of people who can really use it. So it's a really important role that you play as part of the land-grant ethic of, of connecting knowledge and people. So really appreciate everything that you and your team do. So um, last question for you. This is our spur of the moment question. So I'm curious because we've been talking about your background a little bit and um, we're talking about the sort of the basis of food. Is there a food that you had growing up that you really miss now and you wish you could have more often? Like maybe a favorite from your family. <laughs> um, you know, Sometimes it takes you to leave somewhere to truly appreciate what you had. The most important foods uh, uh, for the Guatemalan uh, people are corn and beans. And I really miss eating beans and tortillas. <laughs> so I make them, but they're just not the not same. Not the same. <laughs> they never are quite the same as what we had growing up somehow, and especially when you're in a different place. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope you have a chance to have some really good tortillas and beans sometime soon. And <laughs> yeah. um, I really appreciate everything that you said, the passion that you infuse into everything that you do with your work. And and I know that um, this vision that I described before of you walking out of your lab and talking to those groups of K-12 kids is just around the corner. Um, and uh, I hope that it is as, as fulfilling as your work right now. And I, I know you are, you have so much passion for it. So I think it will be. Once again, my guest today was Ana Cristina Fuyadosa, who is the manager of the Soil and Plant Health Diagnostic Laboratory. Um, and thank you so much again for joining us today. Thank you, Jocelyn, for having me here. It was great to talk to you and share, share what's coming up. The Spur of the Moment podcast is produced by Peach Islander Productions, and our theme music is by Ketza. If you have a mystery you'd like Ana Cristina's team of detectives to solve, you can find information about how to send a soil, water, or plant sample to her laboratory in the show notes. We hope you'll join us in two weeks for the next episode of Spur of the Moment. Until then, be well.